What's going on everybody? It's your boy Jimmy James and this is the second part of my how to watch replays for low to mid elo players, right? Part one we did last week and we focused on early game concepts, thinking about Dark Age, Feudal Age, and then Early Castle Age, right? Now, today we're going to be looking at a game that is actually not one of mine. It is a replay that I that I saw while I was on my, my Twitch stream, I believe, and we were just looking around, seeing what interesting kind of games were out there, stumbled upon this one, and thought it had some really nice uh, late game principles in Castle Age and Imperial Age that we could learn from, and so what I want to do is show this game to you here. Uh, one of the things about watching replays is that you do want to watch your own replays, but you also want to watch the replays of other people, I think. Other people will play with a different style. You'll learn uh, new tricks, new tips, that kind of thing that you can integrate into your own gameplay. And Age of Empires 2 is just such a fun game to watch, right? So we're going to go ahead. We're going to take a look at this game, and I'm going to cast the whole thing. And then what I'm going to do is, since last week we covered early game concepts. I'm not really going to go back over those in this video, but what I am going to do is once we hit Castle Age, I'm going to sort of slow it down and I'm going to break down a few things. So this is going to be kind of a half cast and then half, half instructional video that is really just the tips that I use and the kind of things that I look for when I watch replays. So let's go ahead. We're going to get into this and I'll stop once we get to we hit Castle Age, and I'll set us up from there. So, this game is played. This is a I think a mid fourteen hundred level game, and we can see right getting into the cast our blue player, uh, Ryan is in the blue is the Magyars right. So a nice civilization there. I'll talk about the civs here in a second. And in the red down here in the southeast we have. Boris, who is playing as the Malian. So, so this is a really, really interesting matchup here. Let's we'll start off with Boris's map. Um, well, the plus side is that this is a pretty decent map to wall off, right? It's with some nice, uh, lengthy wood lines. And even though we have forward gold and forward berries, which... It's not what we want, and if we take a look, all of these golds... Well, there's actually a nice back gold here, so there's, there's a way to get gold in the rear of this base if you can go ahead and get it wall up, walled up, and you could probably get the front walled up with your military buildings and things like that too. So um, even though some resources, important resources, are forward, it's actually not the worst base. Now, if we take a look on the other hand at our blue player's base, this one, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit more, I do not like this base as much. To wall off this section here, that is a lot of wood you would need to spend. And what you're probably going to need to do is wall this way, right? To try to get your berries in. But uh, that's you do have two wood lines, but that's putting an awful lot of pressure on those wood lines. And if you wall off down in this way, then... Your wood is still pretty easily rangeable. I mean, this this more uh, this more western forest here is not one that's going to be easily defended, and it's actually quite small. So, um, and then there's this little patch in the forest on the front of the base that there's really nowhere you can take the wood from. So it's actually kind of a a reverse of the base from our red player in a way, in that. You know, our red player had a base that's much easier to wall, much easier to defend with the forward resources, but our blue player has a base where, yes, we have a back gold, yes, we have back berries, both of which are very nice, but to wall this base up is going to be very difficult. So I think actually our blue player really is encouraged for a more aggressive strategy this game, which takes us into thinking about what the civilizations want to do here, right? We see our blue player does have four on wood, which indicates some kind of a men-at-arms build, maybe archers. Usually, if you're going to see scouts, you're going to see three on wood. So that looks it doesn't look like that's what we're going to be seeing. 
And if we do see something like a minute arms rush, that would be uh, quite aggressive. And so that would fit this more aggressive strategy demanded by the map if we do see the men at arms rush here so i would be very surprised at this point uh if it's an archer rush and i gotta say this game i watched it a while back and i kind of don't remember what happens as well so i actually don't even remember who wins so a lot of things are going to be new to me uh as they are to you so anyways um yeah our blue player is going to want to try and play this aggressive with mag gears a scout play could also be pretty aggressive because you get the free forging upgrade you get all the free blacksmith melee upgrades and your scouts are a little bit cheaper so that would be a decent play for the mag gears now for our red player right with this really nice base again we see four on wood here and honestly you know this would not it would not surprise me to see a more defensive play here and really try to get walled up you can already see the houses here that our, our red player is already probably thinking about walling and now we're seeing the barracks come down again really nice sort of walling structure that we are seeing looking out of and we have a barracks coming down from our blue player so it does look like from this vantage point that we are going to see at least militia this looks like a minute arms build to me our red player boris is going 21 population looks to be 21 pop men at arms which is something that's pretty common that you do see with the malians and so uh and we see the militias being created so it looks like that's happening and from our blue player we also see the militias being created i'm telling you guys i've been actually on this for quite some time that and we do see these short walls coming in here for our blue player. I think that's very, very smart. You got to wall this base up a bit smaller, right? You just can't wall it all the way, all the way out like you might want to. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been saying this for a while now that scout rushing to me seems very uncommon. I feel like I hardly ever see it in the game. Um, you know, I've, I've even over the last few days, I've probably got in about, hmm, 15 16 ranked games over the last four or five days and i don't think i've been scout rushed once um i've tried scout rushing a bit of times and uh i always feel like for me personally i always feel a little bit on the back foot but well here we go right we have the militia coming down and it looks like our red players militia is going to greet them getting up to castle age first and we see ooh, we see a fourth militia from our malian player right might be able to actually take this fight and well we don't see we don't see men at arms being researched two militias are already lost i think what our red players decided here is that it's probably not worth it with only the two militia left you're already playing defense and given what you have here there's probably not a point in it. And plus, you probably will lose anyways to these Magyar men-at-arms because these when they when these men-at-arms you know become created, they're gonna have a lot of attack. And the militia have a lot of attack, but wow. So this is actually right, um this is not the best fight that our blue player took. I think he thought he had the hill advantage, but right, he researched men at arms and didn't really get anything out of it. Right? So that's uh it would have been a lot better for our blue player to just cancel but you know that's sometimes just the way it goes now we see the archery range coming down for our blue player we have an archery range and a blacksmith down for our red player right interesting to note our blue player did get double bit axe our red player has not gotten it yet um might be trying to go for a flat fast fletching delaying that but this also may just be because we're seeing a lot more villagers being dedicated to get this base walled up. Again, it's a nice base to wall up. And our blue player, right, is walling a bit, right, a bit more narrowly, but is getting those walls in pretty nicely. So uh, should have a pretty compact base. And we're seeing actually a pretty defensive gameplay here from both players after that initial opening where... They essentially traded units, and it does look like our red player is getting in that fast fletching. 
So Fletching is in for our red player now, and Archer Production is is going strong for, for both players. Our red player is a bit ahead in the Archer Production, but right, our blue player does have an eco kill. The idle times are have what kept their villagers pretty stable and this is a really even game i think as our blue player is getting fletching now and also mixing in a skirmisher so let's actually go to our red player and i want to see what he knows about his opponent right so let's take a look so he knows that there is an archery range here right and we do have these archers coming forward but our red player actually, if you take a look at the, what he knows, our red player hasn't really been able to get out to his opponent, right? His raid was intercepted, right? On the way to the blue player, he needed to fight at his base. So he doesn't know where anything is. So this, these archers here are something of a scouting party, but as you can see, right? They are not really finding their way. And he, this is time that you know, could be spent putting pressure, right? If we can go back to, right, this area. Could be putting pressure down here, right? There are four archers. Uh, there's two skirmishers, though, and that's probably going to be enough to defend. And again, we're seeing a really defensive game here, right? Our blue player is not moving out there, keeping some troops, but does have archers forward. These archers are really just there to harass and, well, there's actually not as many troops in this area. Our blue player, though, given that there's the, the skirmisher there on the hill, probably not going to find much, right? And our blue player, again, with two archers and a skirmisher, isn't finding a lot of damage either. Both players are reasonably walled up. Red's army is kaput. And now, keep this in mind, right? Our red player is on the way very, very close getting to Castle Age, though the archers managed to get in. This is massive, actually. Probably, all right, getting a villager kill with this army, right? So actually, you know, I got to stop this here. I got to stop this here and think about this, right? Um, you're going to hear me say this a lot in, in a minute as well. But the thing I love about this from our blue player is is that he sends two archers forward and a spearman and he's getting damage he's getting so much value out of so few units he's got three more villager kills from three military one of which is a spearman and it looks like he's gonna probably take out this skirmisher as well maybe not um this is such good value right from our from our blue player and and it's really paid off. You can take a look at the KD. Now, our blue player has had a much, much higher idle TT time. So, this is the power, right, of not, of of getting your idle TC time down. I know that's something for me personally that I need to do a better job of for myself. And it just goes to show you, very little idle TC. We have a red player. And remember, these players went for very similar builds here, right? And... Our red player, right, got farms out a little bit earlier, kept the TC from going idle, and even though he's lost four villagers, it's still easily on his way up, and and hasn't also invested in quite as much army as well or upgrades, right? We see double backs came in kind of double bed came in kind of late. We see horse collar not even in yet, and. Uh, you know, it's a lot of farms to not have horse collar, but that is pretty standard with a men at arms build. You typically delay horse collar until a bit later, right? If you're going to go for archers, but this is the tricky part, right? And so one of the things that you want to think about is your compositions, right? And so since we're on our way up to castle age, I think we can consider ourselves in this mid to late game sort of concept area here. And one of the things about this build that's really unfortunate is that our red player looks like he's going to make probably either a knight or a camel switch and with these farms that horse colors research now they're going to start expiring and he's just getting this stable up and you're gonna to have to replenish a lot of these farms now very interesting move from our red player here who is 
really committed to defense, not opting for the second stable, but actually opting for a monastery, right? And so our red player seems like he is maybe anticipating knights from our blue player. That would be reasonable to expect. It is Maggers after all, though Maggers do have a pretty open tech tree, and our red player has seen mostly mostly archers and a lot of them right so it's possible our magger player has has anticipated this and is deciding to stay on crossbows which you know with maggers you do have a very flexible military tech tree right you do have fully upgraded arbalist so it's actually you know not a bad move you can actually do you can do more militarily with maggers than just go for cavalry or at least just in terms of your gold unit. For your trash unit, I mean, you can go Elite Skirmisher, right? You have decent helms and you have, you know, really good Hussars. So, I don't know. It's not that bad. Now, these, right? This monk, right? It's going to do a little bit of healing, right? And we do see, interestingly enough, right? We actually do see our blue player here is researching, right? Is researching scale barding armor. So, might be wanting to go for those knights and ooh, is getting bloodlines as well could be knights coming up here and this is really nice for our red player gonna get a lot of value the crossbowman upgrade is on the way and you know a lot of these archers have been collecting actually at this base so it's not right we're gonna lose this army here but there are still a lot of crossbows and it appears our it appears our blue player is going to do something very interesting. So let me pause here. Here we are. Now this is the this is really the, the first sort of proper uh, late game concepts, right? We're right here in the thick of Castle Age, in what has been for the most part a fairly defensive game, with both players getting walled up and playing uh, after their initial opening, playing a lot of defense with their units. Now you. Right. One of the things that you want to look at in these late game concepts, a lot of them now are going to boil down to decision making. And so what you want to ask yourself is in this situation, did I make the right decision? And so what you want to do is recognize those decision points when you go back to your replay. So when you hit Castle Age, that's a decision point. The decision point here really starts with how many town centers do you want to put down if you are going to go for one town center then that's going to allow you to make a lot of military and commit a lot of forces to aggression right and so right we see our blue player here is getting bloodlines scale barding armor is making knights and has a lot of crossbows right nine on gold there's an indication here that our blue player wants to play what we call a double gold composition, right? That's what it's that's what it's shaping up to look like right now. And a very strong double gold composition is going knight and crossbows and castle age. It's a very difficult opening to stop because your opponent really doesn't have any trash unit army that could really last for it. If your opponent has skirmishers, the knights clean them up. If your opponent goes pikemen, the crossbows clean them up. And so you have having that really good double gold composition can be very, very difficult to stop. Now, affording it, right? Because you're going to have to reseed all these farms. That's going to take up your wood. You generally have to play a one town center style so that you can keep getting the farms out and the food to afford your upgrades, to make the knights, to keep making crossbows, right? If you need to supplement those and add those in, right? So, one town center play right you can go do a double gold comp you can go for like a gold and trash composition if you need that and sometimes you'll see players stick on knights so maybe see something like two stable knights right now alternatively you could go for two town centers right two town centers are is going to give you a bit more economy right you're going to be making villagers from two town centers but and you're gonna you might be able to afford some aggression off of that it's kind of a middle ground approach and the other approach is dropping two town centers right away and going for three town centers. And the advantage is that you're going to get a villager lead over your opponent. 
but it will limit your aggressive output because you're gonna be spending a lot of food on making villagers that you're not gonna be able to spend on making military. So let's go see how this is, let's go see how this is going to pan out and what our players are gonna do, right? We see this small army get cleaned up here and that's a lot of value, right? Four knights taking out five, six, seven archers. Archers are really more effective when they're in a nice bunch and our red player does already have the second armor upgrade. So he's already going to be a bit more impervious to archers, let's say. And this knight is going to stand here and, well, maybe it's just going to be a lookout for our, our, our red player. And, okay, so now what we're seeing, right? We're seeing a commitment to knights, but we are seeing two town center play. And, okay, right, we're going to see, it looks like what we're going to see is something like two stable knights or maybe even camels, right? We could see that added in because this is Malians after all. And that seems like a pretty good approach, right, for this 2TC play. We're going for a mono unit composition, so we only have to invest in one set of blacksmith upgrades. And as we can see, our blue player, right, having to get Bodkin Arrow is having to get armor on knights, right? This is really only affordable on a one town center play right now and only having to spend the food to crank out villagers from this area. And we're also seeing something really interesting come up here, right? We're also seeing an investment in the pikemen, and we see four, no, count them, five spears, right? So this is really interesting. We're actually seeing a double gold and trash unit composition from our blue player. This is a very wild army, and this is going to be a tough, tough, tough army to stop for our blue player, right? As we see right crossbows and pikes so this is such a unique army composition but the thing i like about it is our blue player is playing this right he's staying on one town center so he can afford all of this and this might catch our red player a bit by surprise here because he's going for a mono unit composition but there's a number of pikemen here and that could get hairy he already loses one night so our red player is definitely going to have to retreat, fortunately, as a monk here. And now we see the knights coming in, right? Whew, this is kind of... So this is a major clash of styles, right? Our red player does have the town center up right now. But again, with two town centers, he's not going to be able to make a ton of knights. So, and he's already outclassed militarily. It's going to be hard for him to, to generate more military than his opponent. And he's losing he's lost another knight and we see these crossbows get in and when you're on two town centers going up going up against this kind of army composition that's double gold and trash unit i mean this is quite the play there's not an army that can stop that if you're on two town centers and well our red player right has to concede the military loss right he is on these two town centers and is going to take out a little pikeman there. But now you can already see, right? Even just from being on two town centers, our red player is getting a bit of a villager lead, right? It's only at three right now, but he's got a number of villagers queued up. And the idle time has been pretty even for both players in this game from the town center. So I think, I think both are doing a really good job managing their TC. Okay. So let's take a moment and pause here again, right? So one of the things that you want to look at in a replay, especially if you're going on a one town center play is, are you getting value from your army? This army here for our blue player is, is already defeated. One of the armies from our red player, it is taking out this stable here, right? hasn't really gotten any more gotten a lot of eco kds yet right still we need to we still need to see if we get villager kills in here so but it has there has been some value now it remains to be seen what value could come next but that's what you want to think about with your army here right you want to think about am i getting the value because when you are doing this one town center play you're not going to be able to get the villager production 
And since you're investing a lot in this military, you're also not really getting up to the next age as fast. And even if you were able to click up, you're not going to have enough villagers to be able to afford what you need once you get to Imperial Age. So you want to get value out of this, right? You're going to want to kill villagers eventually or at least disrupt the economy significantly. So, um, and and definitely take care of your opponent's army. So let's see let's see what happens here, right? We, it looks like we're going to see this staple go down and right our blue player is gonna lose a crossbow not the biggest loss right he's only got four though so could be vulnerable to something like camels or knights still and okay now our blue player is going after the siege workshop right now, this is one of the things that you want to think about here right is this the most effective use of your time I do think there's a good argument for this, particularly because you have the crossbows right there. Crossbows are going to be pretty vulnerable to a stray mangonel shot, which is probably what our blue player wants to go for here. And excuse me, our red player wants to go for here. And our blue player very smartly getting out of dodge. I actually like that. It's not an eco kill, but you are right, kind of preserving those crossbows for later and making sure they're not going to be subject to a stray mangonel shot so i do i do kind of like that and we do see another eco kill come in and boy i mean this is scary with this big army outside of your base you don't have a lot right we do see a 10 villager lead though and this army from our blue player which is mostly knights and crossbows it's mostly a double gold composition with a few pikemen scattered in there there's not a lot our red player can do to stop this right now, right? So we have camels, but those are countered by the crossbows and knights. So now is the moment for our blue player, right? Now is the moment. Now really is the moment for our blue player. We do have these monks here. I do like the monk edition, right? We have a lot of counter units here. Ooh, this is really good. Thinking about value here. What's our red player doing, right? Our red player is trying to attack those crossbowman numbers because... That's what the camels are going to be weak to. That's what, if we expand out a bit, that's what the monks are going to be weak to. And now, all of a sudden, there's no crossbows on the field. There are a ton of knights, though, and there's not really enough camels to defend against it yet. But we do have a lot of monks, and, and we see a knight get converted. Okay, right? So, now, our blue player, right? Still hasn't found a ton of value from this army. We're still waiting to get the value here. And now there are a few more crossbowmen mixed in. But you can see, right, the villager lead here is expanding. And all of a sudden now our blue player is not quite getting that much value out of this army. Our red player was never really making archers. And here we go. Okay, this is a major point in the game. So what our red player has been doing has been gathering the stone to get this castle down. And now our red player is sending, sending the army forward to make sure this castle gets up. We have the monks here getting conversions, playing defensively. And well, this is a critical point in the game. If this castle doesn't go up, red probably loses this game here. But if you take a look, right? Amazing defense from our red player. Getting the stone, getting the castle, and now all of a sudden this castle is going to go up. And now a lot of this base is defended. But wait a minute, right? Now, our red player is going to have some of this base defended. But if we take a look down here in the south, right? Our blue player still has a lot of army and there are a lot of exposed villagers, right? Take a look at this villager count. It's actually starting to even out a little bit. Our blue player is going home with most of his army, but is going to try to get value out of this army that's already here. Probably not going to be able to make it back through this anyways, so they're just going to sacrifice themselves for the cause. And when you look at it, right, at the end of the day, we do see our red players now in three town centers. Our blue player is trying to get to three now as well. The one town center play killed... Well, I think there was four villagers dead at the start. So 17 villagers evening out the mill the excuse me, the villager counts here. So the economy is much more even now. So our blue player in the end did
did get pretty good value out of that military, but it wasn't an overwhelming sort of value. It just kind of evened out the playing field with our red player who is taking a bit more of a, a lead in terms of the villager count. Now, when we're at this point in the replay, right, and we're kind of at a, a lull in the battle where it's become a bit more defensive, right, and we see our blue player, right, getting, right, getting the Imperial Age coming in. Our blue player here in Castle Age having a much better idle TC time, right? So kind of a flip where our blue player did not have the Feudal Age idle TC time that was, that was very good. But part of that is because, I shouldn't say that, our blue player just had more idle TC time than our red player. But our blue player was mostly on one town center, so that's a major reason for the idle TC time being so much lower. Now, when there's a lull in the fighting, one of the things you want to take the opportunity to do here is actually scout your base. So let's take a look and see what our players can see. Our red player's got the map scouted really nicely. And what you want to do is you're trying to find neutral resources, right? You want to find neutral resources and you want to find relics that you can go pick up. And we are seeing a bit of a scouting force go out. Well, it's a bit more than a scouting force. It's a camel army going out for our red player really to see what's going on. And our blue player is doing some really interesting things here. Right? Our blue player is now, looks like they're trying to make a cavalry archer switch. Um, and with enough knights left over, this is still a, a double gold composition, which is really impressive. Our blue player is uh, still has a lot of those leftover knights and it's going to have to have a decision to make whether or not they want to Invest more in it to the Cavalry Archer line or more into the Knight line. It's going to be a big decision. I guess we'll see here in a second as another as another Town Center is going to come up. Now, let me, let me pause here and think about something else. So, one of the late game concepts that gets really important, and you want to go back in your replays to look and see what maybe you could have done, is thinking about taking hills with your castles. Being able to control hills control resources and take map control is a really critical part of the game in imperial age why because to field a big imperial army you are going to need a lot of resources and so the resources in your base around this time are really starting to, to run out right this this gold over here is is pretty much done for right the gold over here is gone. So in order to field this army, you're going to need to take map control and control those other resources on the map and also prevent your opponent from taking them as well. Now, castles are a great way to do this. And also being able to take hills, right? When you make castles, you often want to put them on top of a hill because they'll do more bonus damage and take less. And Taking less might actually be one of the more important aspects here because, again, the castle's there to control the hill, so you want to make sure that it stays upright. And so we're seeing our blue player, right? Has Our blue player has recognized this as an important hill, and and this is a very important hill, right, in your opponent's base. It, it, it denies this forward gold, right, once Bracer comes in. So that's going to be very important, and it's a great place to stage an assault. So... Our red player, who still has a bit of a way to get up to Imperial Age, right, is once again going to have to play defense. And so let's see how this turns out, right? So if we take a look at our blue player here, see what part of the map has been scouted. Decent part of the map, but this area to the south and the west has been unexplored, really, I think, by by both players here. So uh, pretty interesting there to look at. Oh. All right, now let's... Let's go back and see. So our red player, right, is also going to put up another castle, right, is, and this is really nice recognition here. Our red player is seeing that they are, that they are having to play this defensively and having the two castles up means that this area is not only going to be much more difficult to attack, but in terms of winning a trebuchet war, our red player is going to be in a pretty good ability to do that. We can see that the villager counts are pretty even here now. Our blue player is now on four town centers, right? So it's evening that up 
And with all these leftover knights, our blue player decided to go ahead and invest into the cavalier upgrade, right? And so one of the things that you always, again, what you want to do in Imperial Age is typically what you want to do is think about getting to a gold unit, trash unit, and siege composition. Now, our blue player has played this a bit more has improvised a bit more here seeing they had so many gold units left over it's not real it's not a problem necessarily to make the the double gold composition you just want to think about then what these gold units are going to be weak to right so you want to be you do want to be pretty careful about that and our red player now is up to imperial age and is getting Ferimbo, which is going to give his camels, knights, right, more attack. And also light cavalry as well. And is getting heavy camel. Now here's an important thing to keep in mind here. Even though this is a double gold composition, right, and there's not that many cavalry archers in this composition yet, right? It's 11, decent number. But now that we've our opponent's gone back more to a knight composition, both of these units are countered by only camels, right? So this double gold composition is getting kind of tricky here. And our red player, right, who's going up against a double gold composition is also going to mix in some cabedos. So this is, this is a really, this could be a really tricky time for our blue player because we don't really have a lot of this trash unit we are seeing the pikemen hit the battlefield so i think our blue player is recognizing that they're going to need that trash unit but the problem i'm seeing here is i'm a bit worried now that our blue player doesn't have enough because these pikemen could get countered by these gabatos and if the pikemen are killed before they can do the damage all of these knights which are going to do bonus damage against the cavaliers and the cav archers if they can get to them this is going to get really tricky really really fast and so I, i'm a i'm a bit worried here that our opponent or some our opponent the our blue player here maybe should have settled on a trash play that was maybe something like cavalry archers and halberdiers or something like that and now we're going to see this battle take place our red player is taking this fight uphill but is going to disengage to allow the gabatos to get in and try and snipe these pikemen our blue player relegates the pikemen to the back of the army we have monks in as well so Lots of counter units in this army now. And the pikemen, well, let's see if they can get some value. The gabatos are, well, the gabatos are actually chasing a little bit here. And there just really aren't enough pikemen on the scene here with the gabatos are able to take them out. And this is exactly what I was worried about, actually, that we would see something like this. And good lord, there's so many camels. They have Ferimba, right? Seven plus seven damage. This is a problem, right? This is a big problem for our blue player here, right? We can see that now what once was a massive army has become virtually nothing. And there's even two castles here. But now these castles are going to be at the mercy of our red player. So, right? right? We saw in this instance the double gold composition not really working out here why the gold composition in principle was countered by the one gold unit from our malian player heavy camels here so we didn't see right we didn't really see it pay off um if maybe we'd seen something like heavy cow archer halberdier right maybe that would have worked or even something going for arbalist right and maybe how Arbalist Halb could have been a very good play. The Arbalist could have taken out the the Gabatos and the Pikes. And so that might have been a really worthy play here. Especially since Malians don't get Bracer. It might be hard for them to deal with Arbalists. So, um, you know, we are always asking ourselves in these late game situations. Is are you getting the right unit composition? And 
I think for our blue player, where I think that the gold, the double gold composition was very attractive, but not one that was really ultimately sustainable. Now, now our blue player is going for that halberdier composition, and looks like they still want to invest in the cavalier. This is a very interesting decision here. Um, we are seeing a double melee composition, and well. Given what, given what our red player has, this is very interesting. So, our red player, right, is going into a heavy camel and a light cav composition. Now, again, it's important here to note that our blue player's trash unit counters both of these units really nicely. Camels really suck against halves, and light cav really suck against halves. If these were knights, this might be a little easier, but... This is not the easiest fight for our red player who's taking a fight uphill and now all of a sudden the army numbers are much, much more evened out. And so again, right, we see, and this is one of the things at the mid elo level, right? Late game decision making is so hard. I mess it up all the time. So this is not me calling anybody out. I think it's really hard and I've actually been really impressed with the unit compositions that we've seen, right? But again, it just shows you where some of the deviation here from, from the meta is that the gold trash unit composition typically is meant to cover your weaknesses, right? So going, going cavalry archer and cavalier was both count that was countered by camels, and then now we see once again the battle flips in another direction going light cab camel was very tricky as well well our red player lost an entire army to pay for it so very difficult right our, our red player is going to want to get to a a composition by the end of this game that is going to be able to counter what our blue player is throwing at them. Now, something we are seeing, right? Really nice from a red player. Again, we have these light cavalry here. Our red player is getting really nice value, doing some raids, right? And especially with these Faremba light cav, right? Very high attack. They're killing a nice chunk of villagers here, and they're forcing the halberdiers to go back into, back into the base here. We do see, ooh, our blue player is researching recurve bow, which indicates going for cavalry archers, actually. So, very interesting here, right? Even when we saw a bunch of camels on the field, our our blue player not dissuaded, right? And now is investing more into the cavalry archer line and is going to get that really, really sweet extra attack, extra range. One of the really a great bonus in the game. And... Our red player taking out a trip. Okay, now let's right. Let's stop here. Right. Now, again, we've been talking a lot about army compositions, and really a lot of late game is army compositions. But something I want to take uh, again give a lot of credit to both of our players here, right? One of the other things that you want to make sure that you're doing in Imperial Age, right? In Castle Age, you were scouting out for neutral resources in imperial age you want to make sure that you've expanded your base outward and we have seen this from our red and our blue player both of them have done a really nice job expanding into this northern area of the map there is a little bit of some there's definitely some stone here in the south for both players here right really nice pretty even map right so there's some stones on that side and i guess that there's more gold on this uh, northwestern side of the map so the the south really hasn't been colonized yet here but the north on the other hand right they've done a really nice job expanding their base out and that's really nice to see that's the first thing now we've talked about army compositions right and this is where things i think get really really interesting so our malian players slap down right a bunch of barracks right malians Infantry gets plus one pierce armor as they go through the ages. So Malian champions have eight pierce armor. Now, let's again, let's think about this. So it looks like 
our Malian player is getting to a double gold composition of light cavalry and what seems like it's going to be the Malian champions or what we sometimes call champ scarls for short referencing the Huskarl. Now the champion should counter the halberdiers pretty well thinking about what this what this matchup is going to look like and honestly if our red player can get to champions with eight pierce armor the cavalry archers are going to have a really tough time dealing with that as well and the light cavalry will be able to raid and we can already see in our blue player's base or right, we can already see some very distracting raids going on uh, getting a bit of attention here so our red player is, I th it looks like they're finally getting to that double gold composition. And this is one that really the Malians are well suited to pull off because of the Pierce armor. They can keep the champions alive. Let's see how this turns out, right? We see some light cavalry just get absolutely murdered on the battlefield. Um, but, well, the long swords are starting to come out. Two-handed swords being being researched now if you take a look right the armor for our uh, the armor for our red player here is not quite in yet for the infantry so this is a bit dicey but this was a really nice fight tactically for our red player or you might say a blunder here from the blue player allowing the halberdiers and the heavy cavalry archers to get separated and now all of a sudden the heavy cavalry archers are gone and I mean, well, there's a handful of them, but even these guys still have, you know, if, again, if I can click on them, right? Come on now. My five pierce armor, it's not bad. And there's still a lot of camels on the field and they're going to clean up. And with all these barracks, right? Again, the champion line doesn't cost that much. And we're seeing, we're seeing a composition here. You combine that with the raids that we've seen and now right now we have this double gold composition the light cav did their job the champion upgrade is on the way this is looking really interesting and this is a tough composition to stop our blue player has lost pretty much all of their army and these champions right or these two and swordsmen about to be champions are really cheap right 45 food 20 gold right they're not very expensive and they're gonna take out the halberdiers easily that composition a bit too much to stop for our blue player who calls the gg right so again this was a really fantastic really interesting game right over an hour in terms of the in game time and honestly it was a really fantastic game played by both of our players here and showed some really interesting late game concepts and showing us where that gold trash unit combination right and gold trash siege that you want to get to showing us that well it can work but it does seem to work a bit more conditionally and that's something i think when you go back and look at your replays and when you wonder maybe why your late game army composition didn't work ask yourself did you have the right sort of triad of units? Did you have the trash unit that you needed? Did you have the gold unit that you needed, right? If you're losing, right, your gold trash army in the late game, um, if you're losing your army, it's probably due to not having enough numbers, which wasn't really the case from our four players this game because they, they both had moments where they turned the tide of battle in their favor and so um, pretty similar army sizes for the most part. It might be because you have the wrong units. Maybe you picked the wrong gold unit. In this case, going for Cavaliers, the Cavaliers got wrecked. And think about how many resources were spent on them. If we had had some other kind of gold unit, maybe investing more into heavy cavalry archers or going for Arbalist instead might have been a better play. And when we look, for instance, at our at our red player, right, we saw camels, but those camels and light cavalry combination got shredded by halberdiers and gave our blue player another chance to get back into the game. But what should our blue player have gone for, right? One thing we may have considered, right, I, you know, is going for some kind of 
light cavalry trash composition for our blue player, right? Maybe something like Arbalest light cavalry in that late portion to get some raids in and we can see how much damage the raids did to our blue player who lost quite a few villagers to those Farimba light cav of the Malians. Um, again, these are questions you want to ask and I'm not saying necessarily that I'm thinking about this in the exact right strategy because Malians can be really a difficult civilization to go up against, but then again, so can, so can, uh, so can the Magyars as well, right? The Magyars maybe could have gone for champions of themselves. You're missing the last armor upgrade, but you know, missing one melee armor, given that the Malians last black, black blast furnace and are going with, and are going with heavy camels, right? Magyar champions might be able to really do a lot of damage against this composition. And so maybe something like Arbalus Champion. Again, there's so many. This is one of the difficult things in late game. There's so many units to choose from. Knowing the right combinations, even in an academic sense, is pretty hard. But then recognizing what you need to go for. It's even harder. And that's why for so many of us low to mid, low to mid elo players, we often struggle at this, this phase of the game. Because it's not only that we don't often get to this phase of the game, right? One of the reasons why I'm showing you a game from other people is that almost none of the games that I played have really made it to a competitive late game scenario. Uh, you know, either the games in before then, or, you know, I'm already pretty down and out by this time and it's really just Imperial Age to finish me off or vice versa, right? A lot of your games don't necessarily make it to this age where you have two big Imperial Age armies and you're really playing through the dynamics of these late game concepts. Now, here though, we had a really nice game that showcased a lot of that. And, and so it's not only the academic side of it, but then recognizing an in game, right? It's just so hard to do in part because also, right? This is the second aspect of this. There's just so many combinations in the late game and so many civilization strengths guiding you to different sorts of things. Um, there's probably more than one way to skin a cat here because there's not only strategy, there's also the tactics involved. So that's another way to think about it. Maybe if our blue player could have got more raids in, something like that, right? Arbalist and or some kind of gold archer combination and then how oh, and light cab might have worked. But how seemed seem like a really good combination as well. Maybe we just didn't have the right gold unit behind it because the cavalry archers get countered by the massive camels. So, um with that right i'm gonna go ahead and in this i'm trying to think if there's anything else that i'd written down that i think would be good to think about here um one thing i will say actually is that both of our players at points in this game did get to 200 population and that's something you do want to watch for in a game to see if you did get to 200 population um that's a pretty important thing here also something important to note we did not see i really we didn't see hardly any of the relics. I'm seeing four relics on the map right now. There may be a fifth one that I'm just missing. Um, one, two, three, four there. Yeah, so we didn't see a lot of relics get picked up this game. That's something that you might want to look for in your replays as well, right? Did you collect the relics? It's a nice source of gold income. Now, the Malians with 30% more gold are just getting a ton of gold anyways. And so maybe if you're playing as Malians, right, that double gold composition is going to be a bit more affordable for you. But getting that Relic Gold can be a really nice supplement, especially to fund your late game armies. Uh, even if you're just selling that gold for, I don't know, other resources to keep up trash unit production, you could do that, I suppose, right? Uh, but also to be able to afford trash units as well. So anyways, that's the game. I hope that these late game concepts, right? It's a bit different than the early game concepts, whereas the early game concepts are really built around, um, you know, defined tasks a lot of the late game concepts are really built around decision making and so there are definitely some things you want to be doing but a lot of it is really decision making and recognizing the right decision to make in the right scenario so i hope this replay has can help you in your gameplay and i will see you guys next week i'm going to be getting ready for part three of this video series where I'm going to be looking at another very interesting aspect of the game. I don't want to spoil it right now. That's going to be coming out in a couple weeks. So uh, stay tuned or stay tunis. And uh, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.